everybody welcome to another community call and the first topic for today is um a pretty cool collaboration opportunity that uh Jorf, or uh, jeff sorry about that uh brought up uh, last week one of uh jeff's brother's best friends uh actually started a clinical uh journal called the um international journal of clinical research and this journal is uh really inspiring um in one specific way they are like maybe the only journal that i've ever heard of that uh, is open access and does not charge any money for an APC and also charges no money for subscription fees. So essentially they're like a completely free journal um, that sustains itself on uh, like volunteer work and donations. So I think this is something that's like really inspiring. It's like a grassroots effort um, from a bunch of scientists who wanted to create a completely free journal. So um, we're really lucky that Jeff connected us with them and we're thinking about ways to potentially like uh, have a loose partnership. And so um, kind of what we were thinking and Jeff, feel free to jump in and correct me at any point if you have more details. But um, uh, this journal is a bunch of like medical students and early career physicians. And so uh, they publish uh, like an article or like a, a I guess like a, version of their journal once a year that I could tell. And so we were thinking we would just automatically upload uh, all of their papers to Research Hub, maybe give the journal itself like a binder's fee, like give them the poster's fee uh, that is normally given to a user who posts the article. And then um, this journal would uh, refer all of their authors to discuss like their papers on Research Hub and then even use research coin to incentivize like attendance at some of their social events. So they do like journal clubs and like talks and stuff like that. And they actually give people like a uh, uh, like internal point system currently for attending these events. So we were thinking uh, we might be able to like hook them up with some research coin, have them use research coin as their own internal incentive. And then also like, um, like partner with us in multiple ways where they send their user base to Research Hub to discuss the articles that are published in the journal. So I guess like the two questions that I have here are like, is this something that sounds interesting to our community, like potentially trying to partner with smaller independent like open access journals? And then two, um, like is this something that's scalable? Like maybe Research Hub uh, could build features where like, um, we partner with journals, give them their own hub, for lack of a better term, uh, give them a finder's fee for all of the articles that are automatically uploaded, and then they notify their community to come to Research Hub to help with discussion. Um, that's kind of like the the overall, I think, like uh, premise for the partnership. Jeff, do you have uh, any more details? Did I miss anything there? No, I think that's like mostly it. like yeah, the, the like the main way we're thinking of like actually bridging some of the projects together would be like. Patrick mentioned where you kind of automatically port over any new publications that come in through that journal. And then on their end, they would just shoot an email to the authors of that publication saying, um, hey, thank you for publishing at IJCR, or the International Journal of Clinical Research. Um, uh, there's discussion going on um, at Research Hub about your article. Um, go ahead and like facilitate discussion and claim research coin um, over there. And so it'll help port a bunch of their users over here, facilitate discussions. And then we'll have other features. Hopefully should sometime this week, there should be the bounty feature that's coming on board. And um, then like the clinicians can use some of those bounty features to help facilitate some of their work. Like I'm a clinician, but I don't know how to do biostatistics. Maybe you can set up a, you know, thousand research coin bounty um, for somebody to help you do like some kind of analysis with your patient data. Um, and then that, you know, helps facilitate and make the website a little more sticky. So that's kind of the gist of it. Yeah, so I'd be curious to hear kind of like top level thoughts from anybody. And like, if this is something that they think it's worth us pursuing as like a team, like contacting other independent journals and seeing if they'd be interested. Uh, Mark? Yeah, I do like the idea of inviting um, the journal. That would be we would have actually the authors, um, you know, have some incentive to come on to the research hub because their articles are automatically getting uploaded here. It would give them more audience as well. Um, and uh, you know, um, I guess the more journals that listen about research hub, then we would have even more access to like bigger journals. You know, um, I guess uh, maybe two, three, four years down the line. 
I think something that might be interesting to to pursue could be uh, finding a way to kind of like showcase if uh, having a paper being discussed being discussed on Research Hub also brings in more citations. I know that's something that is really important to researchers and so on. So if you can somehow like show the impact of Research Hub on the amount of citations in a way to be you know better discovered uh, from other researchers, that could be also a way to incentivize people to use uh, our platform more and even have other journals uh, to kind of like join these partnerships with us. Yeah, absolutely. So like uh, I've seen stuff in the past where uh, journals will kind of market that like having a visual abstract or like a video associated with the paper can help with citations. So kind of as Jeff mentioned, I think a another thing that could be cool here is if you publish and you have some research coin from commenting on the website, uh, you could use it as a bounty on your own publication um, to have like someone like Cole come in and make like a video review of your paper. And I, I think once there's other like peripheral content around scientific papers, it helps with stuff like SEO and just bringing attention, which translates into more citations. So yeah, I think eventually we should totally have like a publication that comes out of it where, hey, posting to Research Hub, you know, and spending $10,000 or 10,000 research coin on a bounty, um, you know, can help your citations. But yeah, in the, in the meantime, I bet, It'll it'll definitely help bring attention to papers. And is there something spe anything specific that you think we should uh, build for this you know uh, target journal that we wanna this first you know a uh, potential partnership? Is there something that we should uh, do just for them because they're in a specific category within the the science domain and we should think about just because this is the first one and maybe you should give it more attention. Yeah, so what they suggested was kind of the tagging feature that we had uh, done a little bit of work on a few months ago, where if a, like a post is a neurology um, you know, case report, it's post the neurology hub, and then there's a tag on it that says IJCR. So if you wanted to search by that tag, you could go into like every you know, paper from that publication um, and yeah, be able to like sort just through that specific journals. I, I imagine that if we wanted to like um, make a business out of this, we could do something where it's like kind of like uh, white glove branded like hubs, for lack of a better term, where it's sort of like the the forum, you know, for IJCR. And yeah, it, it'd be interesting to see what direction it would go in, but it seems a lot like of a lighter lift to recruit journals than it is to recruit like individual authors. And I think there's a nice little win-win situation where a lot of open access journals like struggle for funding. So having some kind of like uh, additional revenue stream could actually be pretty useful and help them be more sustainable. Uh, Mark? Yeah, what, one more point I wanted to add was uh, why it would be very unique to get a journal on board is, you know, if you look at the publishing, like the entire, as somebody had written a really good article recently on Twitter, I should have, I'll post it later on Slacks or something. and. So there are like three components where payments are coming from. Like, <clears throat> so universities and grants pay the researchers. Um, the publication houses are getting mainly paid through libraries uh, who have subscription to this. Um, uh, and, and, and then the last is like, uh, you know, the reviewers uh, sections, which are currently are not getting paid, but um, you know, that's the third section. And so far we have tried to attract uh, researchers and reviewers uh, but we have never tried um, the the publications themselves, um, and, and, and at some point we can also get the academia. Um, you know, so like I think this would be really cool if we can, you know, even um, you know, if we start with one journal, journal and get that second component in. Yeah, totally. It's funny because this this idea has now popped up kind of like twice organically. Um, maybe like six months ago, Open Science Framework approached us and wanted to do like not something that's exactly the same, but something similar where there would be like a Research Hub button on their preprint servers um, where they'd send people to Research Hub to confirm like specific types of bounties. But yeah, now that it's happened like twice organically, it feels like there might be something there. So um, yeah, it sounds like uh, there's like a resounding, it's worth exploring. Does anybody have any like hesitations when it comes to trying to potentially like onboard journals as group customers? Cool. Yeah, good to hear. Nice. So I guess the, the next topic is um, SciCon. So if anybody here has any quick questions about SciCon, uh, Ricardo, who's been the lead for the event, um, is here and can help answer any of them.
I guess Ricardo, do you have any more context? Uh, not really. Uh, what I can what I can say is that we already have an example of a, a two ELN submissions. So if you're unsure about you know what is a ELN submission, you can go on Research Hub. You can uh, type in the um, you can search for the Research Hub SciCon 2022 ELN submission hub, and uh, you will see an example of the submission. Um, there's a one from me. There's one from Todd. So you'll see basically what it is. And actually, Todd Todd wants is pretty. It's pretty uh, complex. There's uh, images, there's videos, uh, so you can see pretty much what you can do on Research Hub uh, to publish it. Um, we still don't have an example of the present your research one, but I'm planning to upload my video by uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, so you'll also see that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I we already received a couple um, questions on Discord, so I mean, I can maybe try to report these on here. Uh, let me go over that. So basically, one question that was asked from um, from a participant was, is it allowed to uh, submit uh, some, you know, some um, posts or articles that have already been published elsewhere? Uh, the answer here is uh, not, is not. So the ELN submission competition is about original content. So we would like you to produce some original content to be uh, published first uh, through Research Hub. But what you can do if you have already published some content, uh, you might want to reference that content and in order to do that you just have to uh basically use our your uh, url embed feature on the on the notebook so this is something that you can do if you already have some published material and the second one is is it allowed to uh basically like put two or three entries two or three posts for the competition and here there's also another no but uh, it's slightly different so you're still allowed to uh, submit more than one uh, piece of content. Uh, the point is that for the only one uh, content among the one that you publish will get through the, the, the basically the, the last round. This is just to basically give everyone the, the same chances uh, and not favoring anyone in the last stage of, of, um, of review. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight is that the content that you publish on Research Hub can still earn RSC if the content gets upvoted or if other people tip your uh, your submission. So I think it's still a good idea to publish all of the content that you want to publish it. But then just keep in mind that only one of those that you publish will get uh, through the, the stage of review. So these are these are the questions that we got. Uh, if you have any other question, please uh, take the time to either open the cam and just uh, ask it right away or uh, send a text here. Yeah, so I guess does anybody in the audience uh, today have like specific questions about SciCon? Okay, cool. That sounds good to me. Thank you, Ricardo, for go, uh, going over everything. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, the bounties feature that we're planning to ship later this week. Um, after our call last week, uh, we talked about it as a team. And I, I guess like one drawback of this bounties feature is it's fairly complex. Like we were talking about like who is the customer last week, right? And it sort of depends on which bounty feature you want to use, whether that's like requesting a peer review, uh, question and answer, or um, some of the other uh, ways we're thinking about applying bounties. So um, and then like I or I guess our team actually wants like uh, criticism on this strategy. So we're thinking about just releasing the question and answer bounty first in order to kind of like reduce the scope to something that's like very manageable while still um, essentially shipping all the other forms, but keeping them behind feature flags so they don't actually show up on production. Uh, we can put them on staging so that way people can share feedback from within our community. But just to keep like the value prop succinct, we're thinking about just starting with questions and answers and then letting that run for a week or two and then starting to introduce some of the other bounties. Um, does that make sense to you all? Or do you think we should just ship everything all at once and like see how people use it? Um, yeah, what do you all think? I think, um, I, I think that I'm in favor a little bit more of like shipping a lot of the features and seeing what sticks um, because we have a different like, eclectic user base. Um, and so some users might not think the question and answer is that helpful. 
And so that might like limit their usage of the bounty and then maybe we wouldn't really see too much activity. Um, and just kind of, yeah, I think like shipping all of them and seeing organically like what people stick to. Um, I mean, like it was just like that for figuring out that bounties were even a thing initially was it just like a few users threw out some bounties. Uh, we saw, saw it popping up organically on the website and then kind of shifted to that. So I think something similar where you have like an open um, thing where you have all the options and then seeing which one sticks and then running with that one. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. It's always like throw it out in the wild and see what happens. And you kind of get like the best feedback just from like, do people use it or not? Um, do, do most people agree with Jeff or does uh, anyone have a different opinion? Would that cause any delay in shipping the feature? Like all of these features that are already been built and they're kind of like waiting, being waiting on being shipped or would that mean that we have to wait until all of them gets basically deployed and then we can ship them? That's also something that maybe we want to consider. Like if it takes a huge amount of time to ship them all together, we can think about like shipping in batches. Otherwise we can ship it all at once. I kind of like agree with Jeff. Yeah, so they all should be built. It's just whether we like turn on the feature on production. So they'll all be like within the code uh, on the, the master branch of our like, uh, you know, source code. But it's just whether we actually turn it on, you know, for the actual production website. So it wouldn't be uh, any delay. I guess the only like consideration, and I think probably the um, reason that's motivating us to consider this sort of like stage to release is that the UX for um, like requesting bounties on peer reviews is a pretty novel concept. So um, we kind of want to uh, like first get Brian's feedback on it and then also like do user studies. So have like some like kind of like limited releases where we invite like specific people to come in, like uh, give them very broad instructions on how to use it and then see if they actually use it, like how we're thinking people will use it. So yeah, the, the theory is like to get some data first on like how will people use this before we ship it to production. But like our, our like user base now is like, you know, relatively small. So it's not like a, a huge risk of like shipping something that like doesn't make complete sense the first time. So it, it's more to make it like manageable, um, but we can definitely ship it all at once and there's no um, real downside except for maybe divided attention from our community. Uh, Joanna? Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, we can figure out the, the audience later, but maybe outside audience can be involved to um, um, say, I mean, to request where they want to be involved especially research laboratories or like, yeah, because some people could work on projects and if they're involved in some projects, being individually is something else. Yeah, so to find something where outside audience can be involved at the same time shipping Research hub bounties. Okay, so so you're thinking we should just ship them all at the same time? Yeah, but I think this will take some time. I guess I, I think like shipping them all at the same time, we'd have to uh, do some like two pronged outreach approach essentially to try and like bring uh, like new users in to try the features. Um, so it's definitely doable. It would be a little bit more work, but it's it's very much doable. Or we could just ship them without necessarily like having a marketing campaign around um, like peer reviews and just see like how people use them first. So it, it sounds like um, people here like would rather just have all the features like released at once. Um, does anybody have like a, a different opinion uh, just to to mix it up? And if not, no big deal. I mean, I I don't think about marketing. I think about just involving more people, universities, and more users to come to our platform. Yeah, totally. It's a great point. Uh, you know, two different like flavors of the bounty feature will have like a, a wider uh, audience in theory. Mm -hmm. Cool. 
Um, yeah, so one other detail, and we talked about this maybe like a, a month ago around like uh, peer review bounties, but um, during a community call, uh, we decided that I think like 10% of a fee um, for the bounties feature where like uh, either seven or eight percent goes to Research Hub Inc. and then two or three percent goes to the Research Hub community multi-sig. Um, we we're talking about this as a team earlier today and like 10 percent feels kind of high just because it's a double digit like you get that extra digit in there and it feels like a little bit less nice. Um, so just wanted to like confirm uh, with everybody what they thought like a good initial fee would be. I think one piece of context here is that it's always easier to reduce the fee than it is to increase it. So if we started off at like 10%, we'd likely come down and it's probably easier to go from 10 to 9 to 8 to 7 than it is to go up from 7 you know, to 8 to 9 to 10. So um, yeah, just overall, what does everybody think of, a, of like an overall fee and then the split of the fee between uh, Research Hub Inc. and the Research Hub Community Multisig? So that's just the fee for submitting the article? So this is a bounty fee? So oh, for the bounty. Through, like revenue generation, yeah, through the community and research hub bank. 10% sounds good to me. Does anyone have any like um like bitter taste in their mouth when they see 10% versus 9%? The 10% feels to be high. Um and I think already having that at 9% would at least psychologically make it better. So if that doesn't mean like a huge loss in terms of, you know, the, the, the fee, I think it would probably make sense to start at nine. And if you want to take three points down, go till six, instead of going from 10 to seven, I think it's totally reasonable um, to do so. Just again, like, Psychologically, feels better. Same like when you see like nine point ninety nine something that costs ten dollars, it's basically the same. Yeah, I've always wondered about that because that never like makes a difference in my own brain. You like that automatically converts to ten dollars, but clearly, you know, it must on like the large scale. Just for a comparison, um, I'm pretty sure sites like Patreon and uh, Experiment.com. Uh, take around 8%. Patreon is either 5 or 8, and I think experiment.com is 8. So the the 10 figure is a little bit nicer because we can be on par with those options for Research Hub Inc. and then the 2% the community as well. Um, but yeah, I kind of agree where like 9 is, you know, essentially the same thing. And um, yeah, we can be at like 7% to the Inc. and 2% to the community. That makes sense to me. There an opportunity to make a salary. Um, make a salary? A salary. A survey. Yeah, we can do that. Where? I mean, I think this will be interesting for universities and libraries, and especially like if it offers something in return some reputation or some crypto nft stuff no we're thinking about doing like some kind of like initial um bonus to some people we'd reach out with to say hey if you have a bounty you want to make research hub will cover it like hey here's five thousand rc go ahead and spend it on a bounty um so yeah, I think there's definitely a possibility for us to kind of reach out to universities and libraries and say, yeah, well, you know, first one's on us kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I want to double down on that, Patrick. I think having that kind of like a bounty program in the beginning would be really crucial for at least for getting that going, right? For getting the wheel spinning a bit. And then you can take it from there and see when people actually start that using or using that organically. But I think, yeah, I was not thinking about that, but uh, initial bounty program, it's probably something that one of my, uh, yeah, take a look at. Yeah, and I think that's why, like, in, in my mind, it made sense to, to separate out the bounties features. So, like, if we started with question and answer, it could be a, a, just a little bit more, I think, succinct 
for when we reach out to people outside of Research Hub and say, hey, if you have any questions, you know, we'll give you like the, you know, the first bounty is on us and we'll take care of it. Um, Cause when you have two separate features that are a little bit different, the email gets longer, you know, like they're less likely to respond, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I a hundred percent agree that we need to have some kind of like, uh, like bounties waiting for people essentially. So um, something we had thought about, uh, cause we'll definitely shift the question and answer one here. I think questions are uh, gonna be shipped tomorrow and then the bounties on top of questions will be shipped on Thursday. Um, so we'll probably have like 10, 15, 20 questions that we just create and put like a, a research hub, you know, ink bounties on. Um, with that being said, like, what topics do you all think those should be in? Like, should they be like kind of bigger overarching questions or should they be more like in the weeds, kind of like Jeff's example of like looking for like uh, uh, nuclear translocation dynamics of a specific protein? Like what, what should those question bounties look like to you all? Do you think are like most applicable to get started? If I have to think about what I use ResearchGate for, that was basically asking questions. My questions was were like really uh, like detailed and close to like what I what I do in research. So only some people uh, might have been able to to answer to my questions. So that is probably something that we want to consider, given that our user base, as you said, is not huge. We might want to start with something broader because it would be more difficult for me, for example, to get the answer that I want. Yeah, and in theory, like the people who would be answering the questions, like for this first batch, would be within our kind of like editor pool. So that way, we could like uh, show like in the cold email when we reach out to people, we could say, "Hey, here's an example. Here's how it works. Here's a bounty that was created, and here's like you know a, like a, a smart scientist who came in and answered it." Yeah, I think the the easiest bounty or not the most inclusive bounty would be actually to use the hypothesis feature to to pose a question like, "Oh, hey, I want to use this medication for this purpose." Can someone summarize a few articles suggesting that that would be efficient versus not? Yeah, totally. We could definitely do that. Like question, you know, can ivermectin be used to treat like early COVID or something? Does anybody have other thoughts on like uh, potential structures for bounties? Because we plan to do like maybe like 10 or 20 of them just like within our team to get started. I mean, there's more detailed one, like maybe about protocols, how to use specific things. But again, these are pretty specific. So I don't, I don't know if we really want to look at that at the first iteration of the bounty feature. How can someone can contribute to Research Hub? I mean, how they can accelerate the space. For, for having that be a question, like how, how can people uh, contribute? That's a decent yeah. one at that time. I think like um, protocols could actually be a kind of decent one. There's some like kind of common um, overarching protocols that are done across like all of biology, for example, um, that maybe some like fresh graduate students might not be too privy to. Um, I know like recently I posted like a, a little mini article on like how to validate primers. It's like a really important thing in molecular biology that like 90% of labs don't do. Um, and I think like a bounty kind of something like that where like of course, everyone, like every biologist knows about primers, they know about PCRs, um, but it's like still helpful information. So protocols, but not in the weeds protocols. Okay, cool. Yeah, Jeff, I'll coordinate with you afterwards to like maybe come up with a couple protocols that you think are like widely applicable and can be used as like a basically like a, a sales example. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Cool. Yeah, does anybody have any other uh, examples of bounties? That was pretty much all I had on the agenda for the call today. Because um, we've got a lot of stuff with SciCon going on. But once we ship this feature, I think it's like we're actually delving into the realm of solving problems for scientists, like helping get people some financial value and creating some buy side pressure for research coins. So pretty excited for it to launch. 
for the bounties. Uh, so one, oh, go for it, Anton. Uh, sure, just real quick. Uh, so one example of the bounty, I don't know if, it, if it's going to be easy to get people to do it, but that's for sure something that people do all the time. Uh, just assistance via the proofreading the article and just the pre you know, preliminary editorial services kind of thing, especially for people who native language is not English, right? So they have this stupid barrier between publishing, right? Where they, they've put everything together, everything looks fine. It's just really hard to read because they're not native. And this one doesn't even require you to have some mega special skills. It helps if you are in the area, but uh, you mostly just need to be proficient at English. And I think there is a lot of people who would use that. Yeah, totally. It, it's funny because the journal that we're talking with that uh, Jeff's friend uh, helped create, um, that's their business model, essentially, is like they rely on donations from uh, like scientists who end up publishing with them uh, for editorial services. So they'll provide like a medical student who will like read through the article and like make sure it like is easy to read and succinct. So yeah, I, I think there's a lot of potential there even other preprint servers and journals like offer that as like a service that you can buy i think they charge like a decent amount for it too like between like a couple hundred to a thousand bucks to have like a editorial service so i think there's definitely something there we'd be able to tap into i guess just along those lines um you can even uh, offer like just writers you know medical writers uh, on there like um, people like a lot of the articles especially clinical trials and stuff are written by like writers who are no way related to the trial you know they just tell them here's the data and just boom come up with a manuscript and it's just along the same lines what anton mentioned so we can offer that as a big bounty too yeah it's a great idea uh, yeah i think writing services is a big one because even like um if you're an early career, like if you're an undergrad, you know you can be a good writer, but not necessarily have the opportunity to like uh, write a scientific manuscript. And this could be a good way to get people's names on papers. Um, yeah, so, so this is like an interesting anecdote or anecdote. I was uh, like browsing Reddit the other day, and I think it was like R Academia or something like that. There was a post about an undergrad uh, SciComm Science Writing Club that um, wanted to pay people to write summaries of uh, like academic research. And so they wanted to pay like their writers $100 an article to uh, write like layman summaries of papers. And so this was posted in our academia and the question was from like the undergrad running this club and said, hey, like would you pay an undergrad $100 to write an like summary of your article? And Everyone in Reddit was very mean to this person. They basically just laughed at them and was like, no academic is going to pay 100 bucks for this. Like, get out of here. Like, this is a terrible idea. And so I uh, DM them and was like, hey, that's kind of like what we're hoping to do with Research Hub eventually, if you guys want to like do it on Research Hub. And this person said that like, uh, like it was no biggie because uh, multiple like biotech companies had reached out to them from that post and were like, hey, can you guys like we'll pay you more than a hundred dollars, you know, per article to write layman summaries of our research. So, like, I think there's absolutely opportunities for uh, biotechs to come in and say, "Hey, we published this. Like, um, can you make this like easily understandable for like the patient population that we're trying to market to, or whatever?" So, it's not like my favorite use case, but I think there's definitely demand for it, and I like, could start to get some like uh, like resources flowing to the ink and the DAO. the uh for the bounty feature patrick i know this one's probably a little bit further down the road but like um if you wanted to start sharing data with each other so uh, if you needed help doing like analysis and say you uploaded um you want to upload a, an excel file or like um an r script or something like that um is there gonna be like i guess like are we planning on having like an area where you can kind of like drag and drop like a file to send over to somebody is that going to be like probably in second or third iteration, but is that kind of like in the mix? I think that's actually pretty easy to add. Uh, we're using like a tool called CK Editor uh, in our ELN. And so I'm sure they have like a file upload plugin. Like I bet it would take us like a day to get to the point where you could just drag and drop like a data set. We'd have to pay for the storage too, so that could be expensive, I think, depending on what the data set was. But um, definitely achievable. Like we could build it pretty quickly, I think. 
Yeah, I think if it's like for analysis purposes and you have just raw data, it shouldn't take up like a, it's like a small like few kilobyte like Excel file or something like that. The only thing that would take up like a bunch of data would be like large scale or a lot of storage would be like large scale images from microscopes. Um, I think those would eat up like a lot of space. But another like business model could be in the works of like a if we go down the premium like feature route where if someone needs like you know 500 gigabytes of storage space that you know they're paying like a kind of monthly premium subscription yeah definitely it, it makes a ton of sense like paying for storage is like a very common uh business model so i think we could definitely do something like that um i guess one last uh kind of like ux question that i have for you all um thinking about the bounties feature. So here's kind of like the pop-up uh, that we plan to show people after you've already uh, started a bounty, um, just to like help explain like um, exactly how many research coin are gonna be available. So the, the way this one's set up, um, like if you're putting a 1000 uh, research coin bounty on something and there's a 7% fee, uh, the available bounty ends up being 930 research coin. So the fee is subtracted from the original bounty that you put uh, like on the question or peer review or whatever. Um, another way to do this that we're thinking about is if you want the bounty to be 1,000 and there's a 7% fee, rather than subtracting it from the initial uh, bounty, you add it to the bounty. So uh, the bounty that would be available for others to come earn would be 1,000. And then the user who creates it would be charged 1,070 research coin. Um, do people here have a preference of having the fee subtracted from the original bounty versus having it added to the original bounty? I prefer the latter, actually, um, where what's going to be displayed on the page and what the person earns is like a, like it's like a nice round number. Um, and whereas what's taken out of the RSC account from the user putting up the bounty is like 10,000 or 1,070, but um, that's kind of like happens in behind the scenes on the back end, so it doesn't look weird visually. Yeah, same here. I think that's how PayPal is doing it, right? Yeah, I think so. This is like how a lot of like, uh, like uh, crypto exchanges do like uh, sending uh, coins out of the exchange too. Like they'll add the uh, gas fees to what you want to send, not necessarily subtract it from what you want to send. Yeah, so Jeff, we agree. We like that style better. Uh, so that's kind of, that's how we'll probably do it. Unless like somebody here strongly feels that it should be subtracted. Okay, cool. Yeah, and so that's uh, pretty much all I had for this community call. Does anybody here have any like thoughts or feedback to share um, before we get out of here? Something else that just popped to my mind regarding the bounty uh, feature is, do you think there's any, uh, I don't know how much of a pain point is actually is for PIs, but I remember my PI kind of like putting on his, uh, on our lab website, uh, kind of like a couple sentences when he wanted to recruit some volunteers from some studies for like biomedical devices. So again, I don't know how much of a pain point it actually is, how long it takes to find these people. But if we could use our bounty feature to kind of like recruit people for some of the studies and kind of like help facilitate the PI in finding these people, that could also be an interesting avenue to consider. So, so you're thinking of like uh, using bounties to help recruit like clinical trial um, participant kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's funny, um, we've had that idea kind of like pitched to us recently. So it's definitely on the radar. And I think uh, a possibility there is a need for it. So um, yeah, definitely something we could do with that. Cool, cool. Yeah, usually Ricardo, there's like, you get this like mass email from your university department. And it's just like, hey, we're going to give you $25 if you're going to put this EEG cap on your head or something like that. So yeah, I think it could be cool. I think there's there'll be a little appetite for that. Yeah, I never, I never got any of those emails, but I remember my professor putting that every like <laughs> once in a couple of weeks that up on the website. So yeah, I kind of think is it's actually a pain point to find these people. Yeah, I'll just say um, I'll introduce myself and say hi everyone. Uh, I'm Emily, and this is just a good time for me to pop in because that's a conversation I was having with Pat. Um, I'm from a team called Immu, and we're doing decentralized studies. So. 
I would say you guys are definitely on the right track there. There's a whole category of people excluded from clinical trials because they're too complicated. Oh, thanks, Pat. Um, they have too many comorbidities, um, but arguably these are the people that are probably the most interesting research participants. So they're also a subcategory of them who are super interested and well-versed in scientific research because out of necessity, you know, they're looking into studies on their conditions. So yeah, you're, I, I totally agree with you guys on that. And if anyone wants to talk to me more about it, um, yeah, feel free to contact me offline. But anyway, wanted to introduce myself hopping in today. Very cool what you're doing. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Emily. I was like, oh, well, that sounds familiar. Um, yeah, I remember when I was in Boston, it was like taking the the train, there would just be like all of the ads would be for clinical trial participants when you're on the T. So I think it's definitely a problem that people are willing to spend money on. Um, cool. Yeah. Any, any last thoughts before we uh, call it a day? Great. Well, uh, thanks everybody for attending. And uh, thank you, Ricardo, specifically for doing all the SciCon stuff. I think uh, the next event we have is an uh, interview with Brian and I and Ricardo on Wednesday. So um, yeah, looking forward to seeing anybody there who can make it. See y'all. Bye. Bye.